Hello everyone. Let us look at some 2D transforms that are required for the analysis of imaging systems and images. Why do we need to put that into a transform domain at all? The reason is there are several advantages when we move to the transform domain. For you know, first one being we will get another perspective of the signal. What do I mean by another perspective of the signal? Let us consider ocean. If I look at ocean, you know, most of you might have gone to a beach and have a have a look at sea, right? It looks, you know, very disturbing. I mean to say, you know, it will have so many tides moving around from one end to the other end along the horizontal direction. When I move deep into the sea, it looks still, it looks very calm. So, the same ocean, the same sea, it is having different properties, perspectives when we look in different directions. Same way, signal also behaves differently with respect to different uh, variables. I take a sinusoidal signal with respect to time if I analyze, signal is going to vary from minus infinite to infinite. It is going to vary its value at each and every time instant from minus infinite to infinite. If I take the same sinusoidal signal and analyze the signal in frequency domain, the amplitude of the signal is non-zero only at a particular frequency if it is a single tone sinusoidal signal. At all the other frequencies, the amplitude, the magnitude of the signal is going to become zero. So, if you see it in the time domain, it is a signal which is varying from minus infinite to infinite in time. And when I look at the same signal in frequency, it is simply a single point in frequency. Okay? So, this is what I mean to tell you. It is another perspective of the signal. It is going to give us different view, insight into the signal. Second thing being compactness in signal representation. What do I mean by compactness? I need lesser number of values to represent the same signal. I need small memory, little memory to represent the same signal compared with the same domain. If you consider the same example of sinusoidal signal, the signal is varying from minus infinite to infinite. If it is a, it's a periodic signal, so I will still I will consider one period. But still, it requires oh you know, those many from, from zero to capital T. It's a continuous time signal. I need infinite memory to represent it. Even if it's a you no know, uh, a discrete time signal, then also I need at least uh, n capital N number of samples where capital N is equal to two by capital T, where T is fundamental period of sinusoidal signal. As per the Nyquist theorem. So, if I take the signal into frequency domain, I already told you sinusoidal signal, if you look at uh, in the frequency domain, will have only a single point, single non zero value, it will have in the representation. The third one, analysis of system is much easier in transform domain. In general, you can, when you move to the transform domain, convolution operation is going to become multiplication. And hence, we'll have three. We'll have, we can analyze the signal more easily. So, with this, let us move to the transform. Okay. What a transform does? Transform simply is another perspective of the same signal as I told you it means that reference axes are going to change. 
reference axis are going to change. Let us see an example. There is a vector 1 comma 1. This is a Cartesian coordinate system. For the Cartesian coordinate system, if you see, this is x axis and this is y axis, the point is 1 comma 1. Now, what a transform does? The transform is going to rotate this axis, the reference axis. The x and y became now x prime and y prime have rotated this by an angle theta such that this x axis, the new x axis is going to get aligned with this vector. Now, this value is going to become root 2, comma 0 because the length of this vector is root 2 and because I am doing only rotation here, the length of this vector should not change since this is root 2, comma 0. What happened? Length of the signal remained changed because we did only rotation operation here. X, the coordinates got changed. The coordinates got changed. So this is uh, in the original domain and this is in the transform domain. The reference axis got rotated. This is a very basic thing that you have learnt you when you were 6th or 7th standard. So we are still going to learn the same thing in your final year of BTEC. What we do in transforms? No, transform does rotation of the reference axis. Actually, strictly speaking, um, we are only talking about unitary transforms. We already discussed uh, what a unitary matrix multiplication will do, right? We will only do a rotation. Come back to this a bit later. Continuous time Fourier transform is one of such transforms we need here. Let us consider the one dimensional case first. The Fourier transform of a signal f of x is defined as f of zeta is equal to integral power minus infinite to infinite f of x into e power minus j 2 pi zeta x dx. And the inverse Fourier transform is defined as f of x is equal to integral over minus infinite to infinite f of zeta multiplied with e power j 2 pi zeta x d zeta. Here zeta is a frequency variable. It's a frequency variable, not a radial frequency. It's a frequency variable if you see. Okay, generally uh, this is referred to as a frequency variable, but you can call it anything depending on uh, the transform you are considering. What we need is not a one dimensional transform. We need a two dimensional transform because we are looking at two dimensional signals and systems. So we have extended the one dimensional definition to the two dimensional case f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is equal to integral over minus infinite to infinite integral over minus infinite to infinite f of x comma y multiplied with e power minus j 2 pi into x zeta 1 plus y zeta 2 multiplied with dx dy and the pair of it is f of x comma y is equal to integral over minus infinite to infinite integral over minus infinite to infinite f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 multiplied with e power j 2 pi x zeta 1 plus y zeta 2 multiplied with z d zeta 1 d zeta 2. These two are called a pair because f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 implies f of x comma y, f of x comma y implies f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2. It's a one to one mapping. It's a one to one mapping. The representation of f of x comma y is unique frequency domain f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 have only one f of x comma y the original domain and if you see the frequencies here the frequency is not the general frequency that we are used to this frequency that we are referring to here zeta 1 and zeta 2 they are called as spatial frequencies they are called as spatial frequencies and the units of this are 1 over inch or 1 over centimeter. What is meant by a high frequency and what is meant by a low frequency? Earlier in time domain, you have the concept of a time and frequency and it is very easily understandable for you. Now, here the independent variables are spatial variables. That is why we call the frequencies corresponding to it 
or spatial frequencies the fundamental periods here will have uh, units of centimeter or inch that's why the fundamental you know the fundamental spatial frequencies they will have units with respect to distance again which are 1 over inch and 1 over centimeter okay so what what is meant by a low frequency the variation of a signal is small in the given uh, area you know in with respect to the distance then we call that as a low frequency and if if the variation is sudden with respect to the distance then we call that as a high frequency you can see here in this region let us treat this entire thing as an image if you see here there's a little variation in the intensity value there's a little variation in the intensity value in this area hence this is a low frequency if you move here if you look here and i move from here to here there's a sudden change uh, there's a letter which is uh, you know there is some text which is here that which means that there is a sudden change in intensity value and because of this sudden change uh, you can see there is a high frequency here there is an important property of the fourier transform which is very useful for us in extending the one dimensional case to the two dimensional case the property is called as separability property what is a separability property let us see if we consider a separable function which is f of x comma y which can be written as f1 of x multiplied with f2 of y where f1 and f2 are two one dimensional signals of x and y respectively then the fourier transform of f of x comma y which is equal to f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is equal to f of f1 of zeta 1 multiplied with f2 of zeta 2 so the two dimensional transform can be computed as the product of two one dimensional transforms if the given signal is a separable signal let us look at the proof of this so the fourier transform of f of x comma y is given by integral over minus infinite to infinite integral over minus infinite to infinite f of x comma y multiplied with a e power minus j2 pi into zeta 1x plus zeta 2y dx dy we know that f of x comma y can be written as f1 of x multiplied with f2 of y this e power minus j2 pi into zeta 1x plus zeta 2y can be written as e power minus j2 pi zeta 1x multiplied with e power minus j2 pi zeta 2y so i am splitting this two integrals i am splitting this integral into product of two integrals integral over minus infinite to infinite f1 of x multiplied with e power minus j2 pi zeta 1x dx multiplied with integral over minus infinite to infinite f2 of y multiplied with e power minus j2 pi zeta 2y dy this is f1 of zeta 1 and this is f2 of zeta 2 so f of zeta 1 multiplied with f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is equal to f1 of zeta 1 multiplied with f2 of zeta 2 so what are the standard continuous time fourier transform phase delta of x comma y we already know that delta of x comma y is a separable signal so delta of x comma y can be written as delta of x multiplied with delta of y the fourier transform of delta of f delta of x comma y is obtained by fourier transform of delta of x multiplied with fourier transform of delta of y because delta of x comma y is a separable function and the fourier transform of delta of x is 1 and delta of y is also 1 so the product the product is 
remaining as 1. And delta of x plus or minus x naught comma y plus or minus y naught, we already know that delta of x plus x naught, x plus or minus x naught will have a Fourier transform of exponential of plus or minus j2 pi x naught zeta 1. Similarly, for delta of y plus or minus y naught, exponential of uh, plus or minus j2 pi y naught zeta 2. So, we will have the Fourier transform of uh, delta of x plus or minus x naught comma y plus or minus y naught as the product of uh, the two individual Fourier transforms exponential of plus or minus j2 pi x naught zeta 1 multiplied with exponential of plus or minus j2 pi y naught zeta 2. Similarly, we can see for the remaining functions also. So, for example, we will see for see it for two more signals rectangle of x comma y. For rectangle of x, we will have sync function the frequency domain. So, because rectangle of x comma y is a separable function, we will have sync of you know the product of uh, the two sync functions as the Fourier transform for this. And for comb of x comma y, we will have uh, comb of zeta 1 comma zeta 2. We will see the proof of this uh, in near future. And what are the properties of continuous time Fourier transform? We already have, you are already familiarized with uh, the properties of one dimensional transform. So, it is uh, straight away you can take uh, now the similar uh, proofs for the two dimensional case also. I am not dealing with the proofs. Uh, you have to do it on your own. You know the proof of all these properties. Take this as assignment and submit it by the next week end. So, we have f of plus or minus x comma y f of plus or minus x comma plus or minus y the Fourier transform of it is given by for, you know the capital f of plus or minus zeta 1 comma plus or minus zeta 2 and it should follow linearity which means that it should follow homogeneity as well as superposition. So, a1 into f1 of x comma y plus a2 into f2 of x comma y will have a Fourier transform of a1 into f1 of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 plus a2 into f2 of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 and the conjugation property says f star of x comma y will have a Fourier transform of f star of minus zeta 1 comma minus zeta 2. This the separability property is very important we have already seen the proof of this f1 of x multiplied with f2 of y will have a Fourier transform of f1 of zeta 1 multiplied with f2 of zeta 2 and the scaling property says f of a f of a x comma b y will have Fourier transform of 1 over modulus of a comma b 1 over modulus of a b multiplied with f of zeta 1 by a comma zeta 2 by b. Shifting property says f of x plus or minus x naught multiplied with f of x plus or minus x naught comma y plus or minus y naught will have a Fourier transform of exponential of plus or minus j 2 pi of x naught zeta 1 plus y naught zeta 2 multiplied with Fourier transform of you know f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2. A shift in time domain will result in rotation in frequency domain. And the next property is the most important property. The convolution of uh, h of x comma y with f of x comma y will have Fourier transform which is the product of the two corresponding Fourier transforms h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 multiplied with f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2. The convolution becomes multiplication and the dual of it says the multiplication will become convolution. You, you might be looking for a 1 over 4 pi square sort of thing here that 1 over 4 pi square thing will not appear here because we are not using here radial frequencies. We are using here simply the spatial frequencies. This is if, if this is 2 pi zeta 1 and 2 pi zeta 2 then we will have 1 over 4 pi square here ok and the spatial correlation you know it, this, this, is, this can be simply obtained by using uh, the convolution property as well as the conjugation property. So, you can take this as a assignment for you. Let us move on. Now, why we are interested in why we are interested in this particular uh, basis function 
the complex sinusoidal. You have seen that the kernel that we have considered in the definition here is a complex exponential signal. Why we have taken complex exponential signal as the basis function here? The reason is that the complex exponential is an eigenfunction of an LSI system. Let us look at the proof of this. Let me apply e power j2 pi multiplied with x zeta 1 plus y zeta 2 as an input to an LSI system whose impulse response is h of x comma y and let us call the output as c of x comma y. c of x comma y is equal to f of x comma y convolved with h of x comma y. So the convolution of this is written as integral over minus infinite to infinite integral over minus infinite to infinite h of x prime comma y prime multiplied with f of x minus x prime comma y minus y prime multiplied with dx prime dy prime. So integral over minus infinite to infinite integral over minus infinite to infinite h of x, x prime comma y prime e power j this the Fourier, you know, uh, f of x minus x prime come y minus y prime is nothing but e power j2 pi of x minus x prime zeta 1 plus y minus y prime zeta 2. Wherever x is there, replace it with uh, x minus x prime and wherever y is there, replace it with y minus y prime. That is what f of x minus x prime and y minus y prime is. So, I can split this signal here. Okay, uh, this e power j2 pi x uh, uh, multiplied with zeta 1 plus uh, y zeta 2 they are independent of x prime comma y prime that's why i have brought it outside e power j2 pi of x zeta 1 plus y zeta 2 multiplied with integral or minus infinite to infinite integral or minus infinite to infinite h of x prime comma y prime multiplied with e power minus j2 pi x prime zeta 1 plus y prime zeta 2 multiplied with dx prime dy prime if you see this quantity is nothing but the Fourier transform of h of x comma y and hence we call it as h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 and more importantly we have f of x comma y again appear here c of x comma y is equal to the same function that we have applied as input here multiplied with h of, h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 so whatever we applied it again appeared in the output as well that is why this is called as a eigenfunction and the corresponding multiplier is called as the frequency you know eigenvalue it is called as the eigenvalue and it is nothing but the frequency response of the given lsi system h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is called as frequency response of the given signal and it is simply equal to the fourier transform of the impulse response of the LSI system and the magnitude of h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is called as magnitude response of the signal system and the phase of h of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 is called as phase response of the system. Now let us move on to the discrete time Fourier transform which is the discrete version of the continuous time Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of one dimensional signal, one dimensional sequence x of n is defined as x of omega equal to summation over n equal to minus infinite to infinite x of n multiplied with e power minus j omega n and more importantly the range of omega is from minus pi to pi not from minus infinite to infinite because omega is a normalized discrete frequency. And again here one more thing you have to be careful here we are not using radial we are not using a simple you know the spatial frequencies here but we are using the radial frequency okay which is omega omega equal to 2 pi into zeta okay. So the inverse Fourier transform of the inverse Fourier transform corresponding to x of omega is obtained by x of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi integral over minus pi to pi x of omega e power j n omega d omega here n is a discrete quantity that's why i got a summation here omega is a continuous quantity that is why i got an integration here extending this to the two-dimensional case let us consider the x of m comma n as the two-dimensional signal under consideration the corresponding Fourier transform is 
capital X of omega 1 comma omega 2. So X of omega 1 comma omega 2 is equal to summation over m equal to minus infinite to infinite. Summation over n equal to minus infinite to infinite. X of m comma n multiplied with e power minus j 2 pi e power minus j omega 1 m plus uh, omega 2 n. And again the range of omega 1 and omega 2 are between uh, minus pi to pi. And x of m comma n is equal to 1 over 4 pi square integral over minus, in, minus pi to pi integral over minus pi to pi x of omega 1 comma omega 2 multiplied with e power j omega 1 m plus omega 2 n multiplied with d omega 1 d omega 2. This 1 over 4 pi square is appearing here which is not there in the case of CTFT we have seen is because there we, there we have considered zeta 1 comma zeta 2 which are frequencies spatial frequencies and here omega 1 comma omega 2 which are spatial radial frequencies okay and again uh, the one more important difference is uh, x of the f of zeta 1 comma zeta 2 need not be periodic there but here x of omega 1 comma omega 2 is periodic uh, because you know we have uh, omega 1 comma omega 2 in the range of minus pi to pi and when we move beyond minus pi to pi we will have x of omega 1 comma omega 2 repeating itself after every 2 pi. So, the periodicity with respect to both x and y is 2 pi and x of omega 1 comma omega 2 is periodic in both x and y with period 2 pi. So, when we move on, if we look at the properties of DTFT, again uh, the properties are pretty much similar to the one dimensional case as well as the CTFT except uh, one or two properties like scaling. So, if you see the linearity property, it says a1 into x1 of m comma n plus a2 into x of m, x2 of m comma n will have the Fourier transform of a1 into x1 of omega 1 comma omega 2 plus a2 into x2 of omega 1 comma omega 2. And the conjugation property says x star of m comma n will have a Fourier transform of x star of minus omega 1 comma minus omega 2. The separability property says x1 of m multiplied with x2 of n will have a Fourier transform of x1 of omega 1 multiplied with x2 of omega 2. And the shifting property says x of m plus or minus m0, comma n plus or minus m0 will have a Fourier transform of exponential of plus or minus j multiplied with m0 omega 1 plus n0 omega 2 multiplied with x of omega 1, comma omega 2. A shift in time domain will have a rotation in frequency domain. And the modulation property says the duality of the shifting property exponential of plus or minus j omega naught 1 m plus omega naught 2 n multiplied with x of omega x of m comma n will have a Fourier transform of x of omega 1 minus r plus omega naught 1 comma omega 2 minus r plus omega naught 2. And the next important property is convolution property. It says uh, h of m comma n convolved with x of m comma n will have a Fourier transform of h of omega 1 comma omega 2 multiplied with x of omega 1 comma omega 2. The multiplication property is the duality of the convolution property. The product of the two signals will have the spectra to be convolved in the spectral domain. The spatial correlation again can be obtained from the convolution property. So, most of the properties are very much similar. The main, the very important property is the energy conservation property. I think I forgot to explain that in the continuous time Fourier transform case, but this is the most important uh, property which is also called as Pass Zewell's identity. So, the energy, it says energy in time domain is equal to energy in frequency domain. Summation over m equal m comma n equal to minus infinite to infinite models of x of m comma n whole square will have uh, the corresponding uh, Fourier transform as 1 over 4 pi square integral over minus pi 2 pi integral over minus pi 2 pi x of omega 1 comma omega 2 whole square d omega 1 d omega 2. The proof of this is also important uh, for you. And let us actually look at, look at this one. What it actually says it says if, if we consider 
the one dimensional case this is nothing but length of the vector the length of the vector and this will be again the length of the vector in frequency domain so it says the length of the vector in time domain is same as the length of the vector in frequency domain now if we are discussing about the one dimensional case it is obvious because this is a unitary transformation or orthonormal transformation an orthonormal transformation only does rotation of reference axis and when it is a rotation of reference axis what you know is what happening then the distance between any two points will not change hence the length of the vector will not change right so that is the reason this this is actually you know a straightforward thing that we can observe without even uh, getting the analytical proof and all okay so this possible side entity is very important next one is uh, the extension of this which is also called as a lorentz series or z transform the two dimensional sequence x of m comma n and its pair x of z1 comma z2 are related by x of z1 comma z2 equal to summation over m equal to minus infinite to infinite summation over n equal to minus infinite to infinite x of m comma n multiplied with z1 power minus m multiplied with g2 power minus n here you can see there are powers involved g1 power minus m and g2 power minus n hence the convergence of uh, this particular quantity it depends on the values of z1 and z2 as this is an infinite series hence uh, we have to be uh, you know in order to get x of z1 comma z2 to, to be convergent uh, you know we need to confine this to a particular region which we call it as region of convergence okay i'll put it this way the set of values of z1 comma z2 over which x of z1 comma z2 is convergent is called as region of convergence this region of convergence is very important to us because without region of convergence you will not have a unique relation between x of m comma n and x of z1 comma z2 what i mean to tell you is two signals x of x1 of m comma n and x2 of m comma n may have a similar x of z1 comma z2 but the for the z transform will be varying with respect to the region of convergence that is why region of convergence is very important to us without region of convergence uniqueness is not possible in the case of uh, the z transform so x of the inverse transform is defined as x of m comma n equal to 1 over j pi 1 over j 2 pi whole square integral the contour integration over the region of convergence x of z1 comma z2 multiplied with z1 power m minus 1 z2 power n minus 1 multiplied with dz1 multiplied with dz2 so and what is the relation between uh, the fourier transform and the z transform if roc includes modulus of z1 equal to 1 and modulus of z2 equal to 1 which means that the unit circles then then z1 equal to exponential of j omega 1 and z2 equal to exponential of j omega 2 will yield you know the fourier transform of x of m comma n this is only possible if the region of convergence includes the unit circles okay uh then the properties of z transform uh, they are uh, again uh, uh, you know they can be extended from the one dimensional case of the z transform which you have learned in your signals and systems as well as uh, dsp distal signal processing the first property is of course the linearity property i think it is missing here okay it's there it's in the second property okay rotation x of minus m comma minus n will have a fourier transform it will have a z transform of uh, x of z1 inverse comma z2 inverse then linearity says a1 of x1 of m comma n plus a2 of x2 of m comma n it will have a z transform of a1 of x1 of z1 comma z2 plus a2 of x2 of uh, z1 comma z2 the conjugation property x star of m comma n will have a z transform of x star of uh, z1 star comma z2 star the separability property most important property we have discussed this a lot the shifting property says x of m plus or minus m not comma n plus r minus n not will have a z transform of z1 power plus r minus m not multiplied with z2 power plus r minus n not multiplied with x of z1 comma z2 modulation property says a power m b power n x of m comma n will have a z transform of x of z1 by a comma z2 by b and the convolution property says h of m comma n 
circularly convolved with x of m comma n will have a z transform of the product of the z no the z transform of h of m comma n and x of m comma n again i am telling you the circular convolution here becoming multiplication in z domain and of course uh, the duality of it again the product in uh, the spatial domain will become uh, convolution in uh, the z transform domain and there are some important implications uh, of uh, all these uh, properties i want you to you know explore by yourself especially what have i want you to look into what happens when the signal is a real signal when the signal is a real signal what happens to the spectrum this is what i want you to explore and what happens to the spectrum how the spectrum will look like uh, if the signal is uh, a real and even signal if there are some sort of uh, symmetries inside the signal then what happens to the spectrum how the spectrum will look like these are the important things i want you to explore by yourself i think uh, you are already very familiar with this because uh, dsp you, you, you have already gone through the dsp course which is uh, taught by one of uh, our eminent faculty mr madhu sir so uh, yeah i'll conclude this session here and uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll have an assignment uh, in this week uh, which is due in the next weekend okay i'll post it by end of the day